cover uh, another a couple of other broad areas where VA gets uh, medical opinion wrong a lot. And this has to do with presumptions. It's something I like to call the presumptive group think that VA just cannot get themselves past. Or VA, VA examiners can't get past. Um, and they will issue negative opinions in two main, uh, two main uh, categories. One is when there's no presumption, no, no presumption to a known exposure, meaning there's no uh, rule that says you get presumptive service connection for that disability if you were exposed to, say, Agent R. And that's one uh, mistake. The other mistake is uh, when there's no presumption of exposure to a specific event uh, or a specific toxin. So let's take let's take Agent Orange uh, in Vietnam. Uh, there, that's a two-part presumption. There's a presumption that a veteran was exposed to Agent Orange if if you were in Vietnam. And then if you get a list of certain disabilities, there's a presumption that that condition is caused by that presumed exposure. Okay. If you're not presumed exposed to Agent Orange, then you can still show that you were exposed to Agent Orange through factual means, just not a legal presumption. Well, sometimes an examiner will come out with a negative opinion because there's no presumption of exposure and therefore they act like, well, we can't make decisions on individual cases that it, it, there has to be a presumption of exposure or you were not exposed. Uh, but Carrie, I've even seen with the PACT Act, like we've seen where, and we're not talking, you know, boots on the ground, blue water veterans, where it's easier to prove something like an Agent Orange exposure. But let's take the PACT Act and a veteran that gets a a Terra memo, the, the toxic exposure risk activity, and it's positive because mm -hmm. of, let's say, based on their military occupation. And it comes back and it says, yes, they were exposed to mustard gas, something else, something else, something else, right? So we know that they were exposed to those things and it gets sent off to the examiner and it says, does this veteran have chronic bronchitis, I'm just coming up with something, do, do they have chronic bronchitis that is at least as likely as not related to the exposures on the Terra memo? And what we're finding, or what I've seen a lot of, is that the medical examiners, instead of like doing research or looking, um, they go onto the VA website and they go, no, VA website doesn't say that mustard gas causes bronchitis. VA website says that, you know, these things, it doesn't say that they cause these things. And then they put in this blanket, you know, boilerplate language about the synergistic effects of all of these things. And there's no exposure that's going to cause this disability. And so I've seen this become more convoluted with the PACT Act than it was previously. Um, but even on, you know, a whole different level, um, so that's like with the presumed exposure, even when, hey, they're exposed, the examiners aren't going to say that those exposures caused a disability if it's not presumptive somewhere on VA. Like, well, you, you know, one, one thing I, I would like to remind examiners of, if you're being asked for an opinion that something that's not presumptive, it's because it's not presumptive and you're being asked for an opinion. Because if it were, you wouldn't get asked for an opinion. You know, it, so to deny something because there's no presumption of service connection. Well, if there were a presumption of service connection, we wouldn't need your damn opinion. You know, so what is it that makes examiners think, well, I, I have to opine in the negative because there's no presumption of service connection. Yeah. We wouldn't need your opinion. We saw <laughs> this a lot with connection so get that through your head anything can be service connected if there's a medical link between the two and we're asking you is it as likely as not that there's a medical link between the two not whether there's a presumption we can look that up and tell we're right here in the law there's no presumption so let's get a medical and i so, think the other thing is like you know when you're looking at the 
full medical record, we used to see we see this a lot with, let's say, kidney disease. Mm -hmm. Hypertension is one of the leading causes of kidney disease. And VA is going to ask the question, is this kidney disease related to th this exposure, this conceded exposure, and he has kidney disease? Mm -hmm. And instead of looking at the whole picture and going, oh, yeah, well, he had hypertension, which led to the kidney disease. Yes, there is through this route. It's very black and white and just Agent Orange doesn't cause kidney disease without looking at everything. And so I don't know if that's a training issue or, you know. Yeah, I, well, whether... I can tell you what that is. That, that, that's because these examiners are told uh, by the people that run their organizations who are told by VA central office, do not opine on things you are not asked about. If you are asked about them, opine on them. Okay, so that, you know, what you're, what you're touching on there is how are we communicating to these examiners? Because they're going to answer just what they're asked and not more. And as uh, we've seen, those questions aren't always good. No, like these people not. don't know what questions <laughs> they're supposed to be asking. But in fact, we might, uh, we, we might can, can share uh, some real live questions with you. Uh, so, so here is uh, a question that was asked to an examiner, a client of ours, um, and this uh, question had to do with special monthly compensation based on aid and attendance, so whether this veteran uh, needed aid and attendance due, due to uh, certain conditions, okay? Uh, now, I'm just going to read this exactly the way it was written to the examiner. And you tell me what you think. Uh, if you even can, if you even know what the question is by the time I'm done here. Uh, is the veterans, period, the appeal for special monthly compensation based on the need for regular aid and attendance is remanded, period, at least as likely as not, parentheses, 50% or greater probability, in parentheses, approximately due to the result of colon, pulmonary vascular disease associated with right lower extremity deep vein thrombosis status post pulmonary embolism esophageal ulcer at gastroesophageal junction and chronic thickening of distal esophagus left lower extremity deep vein thrombosis status post pulmonary emboli right lower extremity deep vein thrombosis status post pulmonary emboli right ankle degenerative arthritis and dystrophic calcifications and bilateral hearing loss. Do you know what the, do you know what was being asked to the examiner by what I just read? I, I don't. know because of my experience, <laughs> but I don't know that a doctor is going to figure it out. So it, you know, it, it, so what what is this? What why you know is this a one off? No, this is not. So what, how did this come about? because VA has been trying to get out of the business of free texting when, the, when people type. In other words, let's not have our employees think uh, and analyze anything if we want to portray a, 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 a thought or ask a question. It should be already typed out. We should be able to copy and paste. We should be able to fly right through this stuff. And because of that, you know, they take issues from one part of the file and they paste them into something that they're doing, uh, be it a, a question for an examiner. And by the time it's all said and done, you read what they're asking. You, you can't even tell what it is they're asking the examiner. Uh, you would think these examiners would get tired of it uh, and send it back saying, I, we don't know what you're asking us to answer. Uh, but they don't, you know, they will just 
kind of guess they'll try to interpret what they're reading um and 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 then that's you know what you get is what you get but um, isn't a policy about copying and pasting and automating like we're not in the business of building cars or working on you know a factory line like these are people and the type of work that we do requires analysis and it requires us to look at the case and look at what was said and dig into it. So in yeah, I mean, you know, what it, world is it okay that you copy and paste like that? Like you clearly didn't even read what you were asking the examiner yeah. and the examiner, when they get it clearly didn't say, Whoa, wait, wait a minute. I'm not sure. And then, we see the, the examiners answering these questions, trying to figure it out. And most of the time they're negative opinions. Well, I mean, if, you know, if you, if you took all of the bullet points off of that question I just asked and just got to the meat of the question, it, it, this is what it would sound like. Is the veterans the appeal for special monthly compensation based on the need for regular aid and attendance is remit? at least as likely as not approximately due to the result of, and then the list. What the, what is that? You know, and For this those is of you that are trying to figure out what they asked, essentially what they should have asked is, does the veteran service connected conditions require him to need aid and attendance and the help of another? Like you're essentially asking for aid and attendance based on service connected conditions. Yeah. That's it. Why was it so difficult? Um, I don't know. And the, oh. the worst part is a lot of times, like when we start getting into all of this and um, they keep denying and we're getting these opinions and, you know, we go higher level review. Some of these have to get up to the board and guess what happens okay. when they get up to the board? Oh yeah. They the board. sit for years now it has to sit for several years for the board to do what? To remand it, send it back down with specific instructions of take this back to the same examiner or a different one. And these are the questions that you need to answer. And the board will then line out the exact question that needs to be asked. And it shouldn't take the board remanding it to give specific instructions on what needs to be asked in order to get an adequate medical opinion. Who did, I mean, three years just to get VA to say, wrong question was asked. We, you know, we send out memos all the time saying that, but they don't listen to them. It's not until it comes back from the board. And I'm pretty sure most veterans would rather the initial claim take a little longer and be accurate than have to appeal and go sit in front of the board just to get proper remand instructions. Uh, and, and there's another uh, kind of up and up and growing trend that I've noticed that it's real disturbing. Uh, but to kind of put this one into perspective, you know, understand that there's a lot of uh, contractors, you know, three or four, five maybe that do these examinations. Typically, you see their opinions all, you know, if you get past all this minutia and they realize what they're trying to answer, they answer these questions all over the place. There's no consistent consistency in their answers. It, it, but that's with exception. Uh, for example, if they're making an opinion on sleep apnea, you guarantee they're all Denied. gonna find the same. Denied. Yeah, they're all going to find the same. They're all using the same language. This is multiple employees, employers, uh, all around the country, north, south, east, west, uh, in the middle, you know, answering uh, questions in the exact same way. And so you can't tell me that there's not communication going on somewhere. There, there is. Uh, and, and in the past, ex CMP examiners have had you know, uh, certain little, like chat room, little chat rooms. Uh, I don't know if they still have that. I would not be surprised though, because there's a new one going around. Uh, and, and I've now seen it through multiple, uh, uh, 
basically through all of the contractors. Uh, so they're sharing these things, and, and this is basically what it says. The examiner will summarize what it is they're talking about, um, and they'll come to an opinion. No matter what it is, it could be a joint problem, a, a mental health problem, and they'll conclude with, quote, without chronicity during service or after service, a post-service event injury or illness is considered to be a more likely etiology. End quote. And the, do they even have evidence of a post-service no, event? No, no. So they're, so they're creating a hypothetical that does not exist in the record and saying, we don't know if something happened after service, but and without chronicity during, during service or after service, this thing that might have occurred, we don't know what it is, it, it was more likely to be the was cause of your problem than this thing that we know did happen in service. And I think that goes just into what the whole... Know, uh, what is that, proving a negative? Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I think the, the problem with that is that it's not looking at the individual case. Like, if there was something that happened that may have caused an issue, like, let's say, you know, the veteran was in the service for a couple of years and was an HR personnel representative and really didn't do a lot of physical stuff outside of um, basic training, but then gets into a car accident 10 years after and now is complaining of all this back pain and is trying to get service connection. In a case like that, I could see, some, but that should be listed in the medical opinion. Records sure. show, sure. and it needs to explain, you know, this job really wasn't, you weren't jumping out of airplanes, you weren't doing all this, there wasn't an injury in service, and then you had a car accident, but they're not doing that. They are boilerplate stamping it with just flat out denials, and case law is clear that an opinion needs to be to this veteran's particular case. You can have two almost exact fact patterns that differ just a little bit, and one could be get a nexus and the other one couldn't, but they need to be specific and they need to talk about each and every case. Um, this isn't a one size fits all thing, VA. It's really not. Well, look, and, at the file, and, look at the records. And understand, you know, if VA central office ever listens to us, you need to listen to us now, All right, Your, your examiners are out there creating boilerplate on their own, sharing it with each other and 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 it's the type of boilerplate that denies a veteran for something here she will never be able to prove that maybe something else happened that caused their condition and that's more likely the the cause of it how can it be more likely the cause when you don't even know what that cause is because you i mean I don't even know how to explain how many ways that's illegal. And yet it's being done. It's being done on multiple cases and no one is calling anyone to the carpet over it. And then so, I think, and I agree with you hundred percent. And the other thing is, you know, they're, they have the responsibility to look not only at just that direct service connection, but what if there was an injury? you know, they, they did hurt their back in service. Their job was to jump out of airplanes. They have a, a bum back. They get into a car accident, which then makes that back even worse. VA is ignoring that as well. And they're not coming up with decisions that even use that as a possible theory. And so the Raiders aren't doing a good job of asking the right questions if there was something that may have happened between service and claim. Well, uh, you know, sometimes it's the, it's the questions that, that the Raiders are asking, right? Uh, sometimes they're the ones muddy in the waters. Uh, we had a case uh, not long ago where we had a favorable opinion on a uh, certain toxin exposed uh, in, a, in a firefighter. Um, I think it might have been the PFAS chemicals, but anyway, there was certain toxins that this particular veteran was exposed to. Um, and that was conceded. 
the medical opinion come back favorable. This guy had a, a renal disease uh, and they related it to those toxins. And this guy was uh, a reservist. He went on active duty, was there for a while, did his training. And then after that, he did training every every so often. Uh, so when this medical opinion got to VA, uh, the first line raider sent it back or tried sending it back. We, we kind of stopped them on it. Uh, and this is this is what it this is what it says. Uh, this is the, the the question they were posing back to the examiner. Uh, veteran was, and that's for some reason all in caps, uh, in service four months only, with the word only in caps, active duty training only, with the word only in caps, basic training, uh, rationale on toxic exposure in basic needs, basic training needs to be explained for the positive opinion on toxic toxic exposure, complete addendum. I, so let me read that again. Veteran was in service four months only, active duty for training only, basic training. Rationale on toxic exposure in basic training needs to be explained for the positive opinion on toxic exposures, complete addendum. That, so that sounds like VA got the positive opinion and was like, no, let's send this back because we don't think that the exposure was enough to cause that. And they, they sent it back to get a negative opinion and leading the examiner to say, oh, wait a minute. Like they can't do that. Well, they tried. Uh, we called them to the carpet on it and we were able to get them to stop it. But the majority of times we would not be able to get them to stop it. We, you know, and they, they didn't have to stop at that time. We just got lucky. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, it, I would say what, and 90% of the time we probably wouldn't be able to get them to stop that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's leading the examiner. You don't like, you didn't want to uh, award that veteran the benefit. So you're going to try to set it up. Uh, that examiner can change their opinion. I mean, that come is on. Definitely, it was brazen. That was brave is what yeah. that was, to put it out there like that. But the thing is, veterans aren't going to see those medical opinions that go out. Um, you know, you don't necessarily get copies of them unless you request them. And you may not even know that a medical opinion is being requested. So the medical opinions different than an exam. You have to go to the exam, but they can just send out for an opinion, get it, and then look at it and make the decision. You may never know that that's going on. Yeah. You know, but I that whole leading the examiner, we both... go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, you probably won't know what's going on no, unless you have a representative that can get access to everything. You mm -hmm. won't know what's going on. And so it's like the leading the examiner goes very closely, like hand in hand with developing to deny, which oh, we've been seeing. Yeah, we've been seeing a lot more of that. There, there has been an uptick in the last couple of years on the constant medical exams and going in. And I would say I've seen more since the PACT Act of all these exams that are needing to go out and medical opinions that are needing to go out. Um, but it's almost like sometimes when they're getting decisions that they don't like or it's not what they think it should be, they're just sending it out to a different examiner. Um, and then they pick the, the one that kind of fits their narrative. We have a couple where, you know, a positive went out and we got a positive nexus, we got a positive nexus, and then we get a negative nexus. And then they deny because of the negative nexus, even though there's two positive nexuses in the file already. All the time. Um, well, here's, a, here's a good one on that, on that note that one of you mentioned that this one, uh, you know, the, these these are templates uh, that they use for opinions, and there's a section that has a, a spot that says the claim condition was as likely as not uh, incurred in or caused by military service. I'm, I'm summarizing there. And the next block down says the claim condition was less likely than not incurred in or caused by military service. And then beneath that is a spot for them to put their rationale of why they're finding one way or the other. Well, this particular one has both blocks marked. 
uh, that the claim was at least as likely as not incurred in and caused by service, and at the same time, is less likely than not incurred in or caused by service. Uh, They're talking about the same thing. Uh, this was diabetes residuals. Uh, and, and well, they opined in favor of the vet and against the vet, all in the same opinion. Uh, guess what they did with that one? I'm pretty sure they denied it. They denied it. Mm -hmm. But I yeah. mean, you can look at this and, and really know which one that they were, you know, were they opining that it was not as likely as not, or was as likely as not? Yeah, they denied it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, and the point there is you have people that clearly see things wrong and they don't send it back for correction. You know, and, and the times that they do send it back is when it's going to benefit the veteran if they rated it the way it was. They'll develop to deny. They'll send it back trying to get something against the claim. But how many times do you see them send it back to get something for the claim? And they're supposed to, if an opinion or an exam does not have enough information, is not clear enough, doesn't just like doesn't list out all the symptoms and the effects of the the veterans, the effects that that condition has on the veteran. They're supposed to send it back. They're supposed to say this is inadequate for rating purposes. I need something better, and this is what I need to know. Um, but I think. Part of that problem is that the contract places that they're sending them out to the LHI optimum, um, all you know, the the CMP contractors, you know, they have so many exams that they're having to do. They're getting paid very little to do each exam, and they're shuffling vets in and out as quickly as possible, um, because that's what we hear from the vets. I hear from the veterans that. I spent five minutes in there. He didn't listen to me. The doctor didn't look me in the eye. I tried to talk to them. I don't understand. I feel like VA just wants to deny my claim. And it's one of the biggest frustrations that veterans have is the CMP exams, which they have to go to. So there are a lot of examples we could provide. Uh, we could read these, uh, we've done some, but there's a whole lot more we could provide. The point is, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. A VA central office, if you're listening, you know, we're giving you ways you could kind of take work off of our plate uh, and affect our bottom line. Uh, and I dare you to do it. I don't think you will. I'm just, I hope you're listening. I don't think you will. I, I, for some reason, I, I don't think a large part of you care. Uh, we're telling you how, uh, and we're going to keep telling you how. We're going to keep pointing out things that are easy to fix, that are wrong in a systemic fashion. That if you were to fix it, would be it would benefit all of VA that handles those claims. It would benefit veterans uh, a great deal. And it would really not benefit us that much. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. No. Yeah, I think it starts with the raters knowing what they're asking and knowing how to actually read and look at it and use their brains that they are paid for to make a determination on the rating and service connection, um, and to ask the right questions to the examiner so that the examiner can actually respond in a fashion that makes sense and can be rated on. Um, mm -hmm. It starts with the, the raters asking the right questions to know what's going on in the file, to know what questions need to be answered instead of just copying and pasting and asking questions that make absolutely no sense. Mm 